Hello, my name is Christopher Wheely, and I'm here to talk about the effects of soda lime glass ion exchange on the flexural strength and fracture behavior. This is a lab that I performed with my group in the Materials Lab 1 with Dr. Koshel as our PI. First, I would like to go over my presentation, looking at the ion exchange process and the testing equipment we used for our experiments. Then with that knowledge, looking at our hypotheses, talking through the procedure and how we ion exchange the glass. Then looking at the data of both the mechanical strength as well as the diffusion of ions into the glass rods. And finally, concluding on how our hypotheses were supported or if they were, and then what we can experiment on in the future to learn more about the exchange as well as any errors we found along the way. Soda lime glass ion exchange is useful because it's an easy way to take an inexpensive, commonly available glass and strengthen it for a variety of purposes. Looking deeper into this process helps us better understand the diffusion process itself, how it impacts the microstructure, and how that in turn develops the in material properties that we see on the macro scale. In this case, we're looking at the theoretical strength of the glass. On the right hand side, you can see the exchange of different ions, in this case sodium, is seeking to replace the ions currently in the piece. And because sodium has a larger atomic radius versus the ions currently in there, it creates a compressive stress by kind of overcrowding the microstructure. And it's this stress that improves the theoretical strength of the material. So brittle materials like glasses perform weak in tension. And so instead of the standard tensile test for these materials, we use the four point bend test. And the four point bend test uses four contact areas to develop a moment across a beam, or in this case, a rod, and uses that moment to create greater internal forces until the material fractures. And in using four points, we create an entire area of maximum moment, which helps to average out the various defects in a compressive material like ceramics would produce. And so that helps eliminate kind of the inconsistency that we see with various defects in brittle materials. And then finally, taking this maximum force P, we can use it to create our theoretical strength using this equation. Now, in order to look at the diffusion and the elemental components of these glass rods, we used scanning electron microscopy and specifically energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy using an SEM. EDX is a way to determine the elemental composition of materials by looking at the telltale X-rays that materials leave off. And so in this case, you have electrons that are being excited, impacting core electrons in the material. And these core electrons are being kicked out of the atom. And so since these core energy levels are at a lower energy level and therefore more stable, other electrons from outer shells are being sent down to this lower energy level to fill up the electron that was left out. And so it is this lowering of energy levels that produces excess energy. And we use this excess energy in order to, in the form of X-rays. And using the different elements, all these different elements expel the specific wavelengths of materials. And we can use these specific wavelengths like a fingerprint, identifying different components of all elements, and then using these elements to find the composition ratios in the material. So our hypotheses focus on the diffusion rate of these ions into the glass rods and that impact on the theoretical strength of the glass rods. So first, we expect that the diffusion rate of ion exchange into the solar lime glass will follow a positive nonlinear relationship with respect to time. Knowing the diffusion equations like Fick's first law, we understand that there's rarely a linear relationship with diffusion, and so we can expect that the diffusion of ions will increase over time, but in a nonlinear fashion. Secondly, the diffusion rate will cause a positive correlation with the strength of the glass, and potassium will cause greater strengthening versus sodium. And we expect potassium to have a greater strengthening because it has a larger atomic radius that increases the overcrowding effect and increases the compressive strength overall. Finally, the sodium solvent will result in a higher diffusion rate of the silver nitrate solute due to the smaller size of the sodium atoms. And so just as these sodium atoms help prevent a greater strengthening, 
they do improve the diffusion of the ions into the material. So looking at the experimental procedure, we use two baths to measure the differences using a sodium nitrate bath and a potassium nitrate bath to produce sodium plus and potassium plus ions respectively. We also included an eight gram or one weight percent amount of silver nitrate in both. And the silver nitrate, due to its small radius, won't have a strong strengthening effect, but we hope to have a higher visibility on SEM and XDS. And so that's why we included that. To measure the diffusion with respect to time, we tested four different times at 15 minutes, 30, 60 minutes, and finally 48 hours to measure long-term diffusion. In order to measure the theoretical strength, we used the four-point bin test with Weibull analysis, I will talk about later. And then to see the corresponding diffusion, we used scanning electron microscopy, XDS, and then we used fracture stereo microscopy to see the effect of ion diffusion on the fractures of the materials. So we used Weibull distribution to measure the theoretical strengths and analyze uh, the four-point bin test data. And we use the Weibull distribution with a logarithmic scale on the x-axis of the theoretical strength, as well as the survival probability on the y-axis, which measures the likelihood of failure based off of a certain stress th threshold. And so we can see here that the trend lines are used to measure the Weibull modulus, which is the slope, measures the consistency of the data as well as the where it intersects with the x-axis is the theoretical strength, which helps get us a, a better average, if you will, of the strength data for each different section. We have the sodium nitrate all different times measured with the control. And you can see that most of the data is centered all around the control experiment, which tells us that based off of this data, there wasn't really measurable differences in the strengthening of the glass using sodium versus the control. However, what we do see is that with the 48 hour sodium nitrate, there is a higher trend line. The slope is higher, which results in a higher Weibull modulus. And this tells us that for the 48 hour data, that material has the highest consistency. All of the failures happen to roughly the same part, they were the closest together. And this makes sense that the 40 hour has the highest diffusion would create the most consistent data. On the other side with the potassium, we do see quite a bit different between the control data as well as with the various times. With the 48 hour having both the highest theoretical strength, highest intersection with the x-axis as well as the highest Weibull modulus. And so here you can see that with the 15 minute, 30 minute, and 60 minute data, it also is relatively close to the control. And so there wasn't substantial strengthening there. However, with the 48 hour data that had enough time where we can measure a definite strengthening of the material. And also we have greater consistency. And so to better understand what's happening with these different consistencies across time, we can look to see the concentration of ions going through time. And we can see at time is zero, you have a pretty uniform concentration with ions starting to insert an exchange of the glass rods at the edges. And as we get closer to the 15 to 16 minute mark that we see at our iron exchanges, the glass rods on the outside have had more access to ions. There is greater flow of ions to these glass rods and as such, they've had greater diffusion. And so we would expect different and greater strengths from these glass rods. Likewise, in the center, on the inside rods, there's corresponding less diffusion. There's corresponding a uh, lower concentration of ions. And so we would expect to see a lower strength from these. And it is from these different concentrations that we can expect the different strengths that we saw at the lower temperatures and or lower times. However, at the long time, at 48 hours, you have the time for the concentrations to reach an equilibrium all across the cage. 
And so here, the concentration is equivalent whether you're on the inside or the outside. And so here we would expect that the strength should be relatively the same because all of the different rods have had the same diffusion concentration available to them. Okay, here we are looking at the sodium solution XRD profiles from some of our samples. And right now these are looking at distance going into the glass rods as the distance increases, the distance into the glass rod increases. Where at approximately 10 micro micrometers, you see the both the sodium in red and the silver in gray jump up, showing that we're going from the epoxy mold to the actual glass rod itself. And we can see our control, it is various, kind of all over the board with some relatively high spikes of sodium and silver, but pretty random. We can expect this from either errors in preparation, from sputtering film, or from the graphite paint that we applied to the surface and other areas in which the XRD is failing to correctly get these proper sodium and silver concentrations. However, at the 30 minute and 48 hour, we can start to see the sodium in red level off going through the depth of the material. And we can expect this due to the sodium ions start to reach an equilibrium point of concentration within the material where they can't diffuse any further. And so we would expect if it's reached this point that it would be level all the way across regardless of depth. And we can see at the 48 hour we also have this kind of leveling off of the sodium ions. However, we seem to have a lack of silver at any point, which may be due to an error in preparation of adding the silver to the original solution. With the potassium solution, we had slightly better results with silver, where you can see both potassium and silver uh, jump up as you reach the surface of the glass rod here, and then slowly go back down in concentration as we get deeper and deeper into the glass rod. Here, at the same way, you can see the silver and green at the surface of the material, and then begin to lessen in concentration as the depth increases into the glass rod. And so this was, we were able to see the silver and indeed see this ion diffusion happen uh, live. And so we were able to pick up this. But, and we were also able to see the potassium as well. However, the potassium was limited in, again, to those large sizes where you can see that the silver was able to reach uh, much farther into the material. The potassium was limited due to its large atomic radius. In addition, we saw that the potassium had a discoloration on these materials of a yellowish opaque tint. And so this was another clue that we were indeed seeing ion diffusion happen in the glass rods. Finally, using a stereo microscope, we were able to examine the fracture mechanics going through the glass. Now, the glass is much too fast to actually observe the fracture as it's happening. But in looking at the fracture surfaces after the fact, you can get an idea of the different fractures that are occurring. With brittle materials like ceramics, there is kind of a classic fracture method of nucleation, mirror, mist, and hackle, in which from the original nucleation point uh, here in red, the crack propagates into the mirror region. And the mirror region is very flat and smooth. You can also see it here, is due to the plane of fracture being very, very close to the original nucleation point. In fact, it's smaller than the wavelength of light, and so that's why it is invisible and looks very smooth to the surface, because that fracture plane is so close to its original plane. However, as you get farther away, you start to see mist and hackle, where these, plane, these fracture planes are beginning to distend away from the original plane, and so you start having in the mist region small ridges, which propagate into larger cracks, which are called the hackle section. And so you can see kind of a zoomed in area of all the different regions here on the right. And then on the left, you can see a zoomed out, where you see the nucleation point here, moving into mirror, and then a little bit of mist, and then mostly hackle, radiating in all directions out from the original glass tube. And so these pictures were taken from the primary nucleation point 
primary fracture point. However, in other areas, the fractures can be different depending on the shape of the fracture. In some cases, we actually saw a cantilever action where as the rod is being bent down under the four point bend test, you have it curving and that curves the crack as you can see here. In which, and so you can see the crack start to curve from the bottom where it breaks first due to tension from the bend test and then all the way up to the top. And in some cases, such as when you see here, it actually starts to bend back down again. And from these alternate fracture places, you have the chance to see other fraction mechanisms other than the mirror missed tackle we talked about. Here at the first nucleation point on the bottom, you can see the hackles on both on all three surfaces. But and looking at the secondary feature, we can also look at other fracture types. So again, looking at the secondary end from that compound fracture uh, caused by cantilever, you can see the, a mirror region, very smooth as we saw before. But in addition, as it bends back down, you start to see these kind of thin marks that are not quite radial like the hackles were, but are just kind of sticking out. And in this case, we see them in three different areas, as you can see by the arrows. And these are called lances due to the sharp uh, shape that they are resembling lances. And these are most likely due to the secondary fracture type where instead of one nucleation point causing one nucleation plane, you have additional forces from the twisting of the rod, the bending of the rod. And because it's kind of a combination of force instead of just one direction, it can create these alternate lance type fractures that we can see here. So now looking at our hypotheses, and we can now talk about which were supported and which were not based off the data that we gathered. First, looking at that diffusion rate and it following a positive nonlinear relationship with respect to time. We can confirm that. We found that the diffusion was found to increase at longer exchanges, as we saw in the 48 hours on both the potassium and the sodium. It was found to have a substantially higher Weibull modulus, suggesting a more even concentration, as well as we saw silver on the 48 potassium, which confirmed that at longer distances and longer times, you saw those greater distances of diffusion. On the diffusion rate with a positive correlation with the strength of the glass, we are inconclusive. With the potassium, you see that strengthening, especially in the 48 hour Weibull modulus. But with the sodium, everything was kind of gathered around the control group and so it was inconclusive on whether we saw any strengthening actually from the sodium ions. With the potassium causing greater strengthening versus the sodium, we did see this. We did see the potassium having greater versus the control and also a difference from that control group. So we can expect uh, to be stronger based off of that. And finally, the sodium solvent. Uh, we did see silver diffuse further on the sodium, but we're not sure if that was due to the actual sodium itself or due to a failure in preparation for those samples. Finally, looking over the future research, we found that the diffusion was most popular at longer exchanges. And so measuring these at exchange times greater than one hour would be enormously beneficial to find the diffusion behavior at these long ranges and to better characterize it besides just a, no a positive nonlinear relationship. And finally, looking at other research, higher temperatures uh, 425 and 450 could be tested, and we would expect to have a higher diffusion from these higher temperatures should we test them again. Thank you for listening to my presentation and have a great rest of the day.